praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more, what love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea with a bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. What patience and wait as we constantly roam. What Father so tender is calling. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness. His blood was the payment, His life was the cause. We stood in the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more.
When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they had opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there, and he entered the house of a certain man named Justice. <clears throat> one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Amen. Hear these praises from 
Each time I think of you, praise the stars, love you so much, Jesus, love you so much. Lord, I love you with my soul sings, here in your presence, carried on your
time, we're going to not do that one again. We'll go right on to the last. Lift high the name of Jesus. You know, I think you might want to stand. I think you might want to stand for this. Are we ready? Are we ready? Lift high the name of Jesus, of Jesus, our King. Make known the power of His grace, the beauty of His peace. Remember how His mercy reached, and we cried out to Him. He lifted us to solid ground, to freedom from our sin. Oh, see. Father, thank you for this good day. Thank you for the privilege it's ours to be here. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for health and strength. Thank you, Father, for bringing Brother Ron to visit with us. Thanks for bringing Dave and Cindy back to be with us. Father, we thank you for every person that's here today. Thank you for those who are visiting with us. And Lord, we're just so grateful that you show your mercy and grace to us every day. Thank you, Father, for the message of salvation in Jesus Christ. And it's in our Savior's precious name we pray. Amen. Is there anybody here that would deny the fact that we're living in rather confusing times? You know, my father passed away young. He was the age I am now. He was 66 years old when my father passed away, heart issues. And um, I never thought about missing my father until I missed him. Never thought about what it would be like to not have my father around until he wasn't there. And okay, I was... 23 or 4 at the time and, and um, you know when you're that age you think you pretty well have the world you know you got it figured out and uh, then you get to 30 and you find out now maybe maybe not and then you get to 40 and you go man I really didn't have it figured out and you get to 50 and you go well, how could I have been so wrong but in any case you know there's times when you wish you had that person to, around to give you counsel and advice as to what's going on and what I mean there are times wouldn't you just like to be able to sit down with that person that you so respected from the past and just talk about what's going on and and maybe in times that are as confusing as the ones we live in right now we may even be prone to wonder about God's will we would like to know what God's will is and yet we know what God's will is that's the interesting thing and God's will hasn't really changed um, he may have specific directions that are different for, for us individually, but we know he's given us some information. In, in 2 Peter 3, he says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all 
should come to repentance, that all should reach repentance. So one thing we know about the will of God that has never changed is that God cares deeply about lost men and women. He cares about their salvation. And by the way, just because we're a little unsure about what's happening right now, and just because God's patience with a wicked generation seems to continue, is no indication that he's somehow lost touch with what's going on. It doesn't mean that he's ignorant, and it doesn't mean that he doesn't care. It's that he genuinely cares about lost souls. And his patience is amazing, especially in these days in which we live. We see the mercy and grace of God, and we find that his will is, is that not any would perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he said, oh, wait a minute, Pastor. What about the sovereignty of God? I mean, which is it? Man, freedom to choose, or is it the sovereignty of God? And, you know, it's a, it's a great question. There were times when I was in seminary where the professors laid it out all mathematical-like, and you go, oh, yeah. And then with time, you're going, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, and you're looking at Scripture, and it's not always so easy and clear-cut. Yes, God is sovereign, isn't He? Of course He is. And, and yet... Uh, his offer of salvation to sinful men is also bona fide. He's not like tricking people. I mean, look at John chapter 1. He was in the world. The world was made through him. The world did not know him. He came to his own. His own did not receive him. But as many as received him, well, that sounds like free will. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Does it not? <sighs> to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. But of, well, that sounds like God's sovereignty. <laughs> what, well, which is it? Just in this short two verses, you have, on one hand, mankind receiving salvation. On the other hand, you have that we're not born of our own, uh, in terms of salvation, being born again. We're born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor even of the will of man, but of God. You know, I think maybe this question is above the pay grade of most of us. I think maybe it's one of those issues we can agree to leave with God. But there's one thing that we do know. God genuinely, it is genuinely His will that all men would repent and come to salvation in Jesus Christ, is it not? And there's something else that goes with it that we also know, and that is that God has called Every one of us who are blood-bought believers in Jesus Christ, he's called every one of us to share the message of salvation of, in Jesus Christ with those who don't know. Every one of us have that privilege. And, and, and this morning, I, I don't want to come with a hammer. Sometimes, you know, in the book of Jeremiah, it says God's word is like a hammer on the rock. I don't want to come with a hammer this morning. I want to come encouraging, encouraging us to discover that, that one of the greatest privileges we have in the Christian life is the privilege of sharing the message of salvation in Jesus Christ. So we want to talk about that today. But I, it's interesting to me that as we look at this passage in, in Acts chapter 18 of the Apostle Paul going to Corinth and the things that happen and the things that are described for us in this passage, it, it's kind of ironic. It's, it's as if knowing God's will goes together with evangelism. Why did I say that? Well, if, if, if God has commanded all of us who are Christians to be his ambassadors, to share the message of salvation, if God has revealed that to us, and we have that in his word, right? And we choose to ignore it or not really fulfill it. So we're not really telling people about Jesus Christ in any meaningful way then why would we expect God to come through and fill, and fill us in on the other things that we ought to be doing? He already told us what we should be doing. He told us that we should be talking to people about Christ. And if we refuse to do that, then why would we expect to say, oh, I'm, I'm not going to do that, God, but by the way, I want to know, should I make a move? Should I buy a house? Should I you know, get married? Should I? It's a little late for me on that one. It, what, you know, what, what is your will for me? Well, his will, we already know. The first part of his will is that we ought to be sharing the message of salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, please, I don't want to hammer. I want to, I want to encourage us to think about this based on what took place with Paul in his going to, to the city of Corinth. Let's seek God's will through evangelism because there's a connection, all right? Four choices, and the first is preach Christ. Preach Christ. That's not complicated. It's a choice that we all have. 
When Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the Word. I chose the NASB for putting this up because there's actually a textual variant, and I think this is closer to being correct and accurate, not because I think it, because Bible scholars believe that. When Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the Word. And that fits with the context, because remember, he first went to Corinth, he didn't have any financial support, so he had to go to work making tents. And so he's making tents to support himself, so he's working probably six days a week, and he would go to the synagogues on the Sabbath and share the message and talk to them about the Lord, but he couldn't do it full time. So when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia and they had funds to support him, he could quit his day job and he could devote himself. Now, it's a wonderful thing that God has blessed in in, in America to where we can have full-time people that we pay to be involved in ministry. We have uh, evangelists. We have places like the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association that some people contribute to, or, or maybe you contribute to somebody that's a prophecy teacher or and you contribute to the, to the support of a local church, and we support our missionaries. It is wonderful that we can support and have full-time Christian workers. But that does not in any way, shape, or form relieve all of us who know the Lord from the wonderful privilege that's ours to talk, to share the message of salvation in Jesus Christ. We may not be able to do it full-time, but we still have this privilege. Well, Paul, when Silas and Timothy came, they began, he began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. So preach Christ. So he, he devoted himself entirely to it. Now, most of us who have jobs, we can't you know, be working at this all day every day, but we, there's something about the gospel, sharing the gospel, if we've all been called to do it, that at some point we may actually have to say his name. I mean, at some point, at somewhere along the way, we may actually have to say the name of Jesus. I think you know where I'm going with this. Um, Because sometimes I fear that as Christians, we have been intimidated into silence. Satan wants nothing more than for us to be entirely silent, to where in our interactions with people in the real world, it's as if, you're not allowed to talk about that. that's religion and that's you're proselyting, proselytizing or however they say it. You're not allowed. Uh, wait a minute. Really? Are we not allowed to talk about the most important person in our life? Assuming that he is the most important person in our life. And I fully understand it's possible for us to be intimidated into silence and think that, well, you know, I, I don't know if I could really share And yet we read in Jude 20, and and we we haven't looked at these verses for a little while, but he says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And all the commentaries I've ever read all say, looking for the mercy of of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life is about looking for the Lord's mercy and saving us. But because of what comes right after, there's no break in the, there's no period at the end of this sentence. And the very next word is and in the Greek New Testament. And it talks about evangelism. I really believe that when he says, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy, God's already shown his mercy to me. Now it's my opportunity to be looking for that person that God would touch with the gospel, open their heart, looking for the opportunity to God to show his mercy on that other person. That's what we're to be looking for. And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments defiled by the flesh. And so the opportunity to speak to someone and looking for that. In 2 Corinthians, Paul says, for the love of Christ compels us. Uh, somewhere along the way, a Bible teacher once said to me that what that word compels means is sort of like what you do with a tube of toothpaste. When you want to get toothpaste out, you squeeze it and out it comes. And that's kind of the idea. The love of Christ compels us. I think, is it possible that we could be born again Christians who've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and the love of Christ never compel us? 
Hmm, that raises some serious questions in our mind because the love of Christ, if we, are, if we understand how we have been saved and our, the love of Christ is acting in our lives, it should squeeze us. It should, it should move us to actually speak and to share with people for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one, Jesus Christ, died for all, then all died and he died for all, that those who live, those of us who put our faith in him, should live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died for us and rose again. It goes on a few verses later in the same passage. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, there's, there's nothing that compares with the ministry of reconciliation. I mean, can you imagine being in the place of taking two Parties that are at odds and, and bringing them together in reconciliation where both parties are happy, they're able to agree. And we have the privilege, we've been given the ministry of reconciling people who are lost and separated from God to forgiveness and, and cleansing and coming back to fellowship with Him. Wow! That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Uh, this is amazing. We have the privilege of sharing the message that will see people reconciled to Almighty God. That's the privilege that's been given to us. He's committed the word of reconciliation to us. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, I, I tell you what I'm going to do. I want to take a moment this morning and um, have some audience participation. I don't know about you, but being a Christian is the most awesome thing in the world. And if it isn't, then we will never reach anyone with the gospel of Christ, will we? If, if being a Christian for us is just kind of, right? Then how will anyone say, oh, I want some of that? Right? No. If, if, we, if we do not have... A, so, so let me ask you something. When you think about being a Christian and what it has done for you and what are the benefits, what would you say are some of the most awesome benefits of being a Christian? There's a whole bunch. Who's going to be first? Just one thing that you realize being a Christian is awesome because. Can you catch? I didn't, I didn't really want to go first, but I've had something on my heart. Maybe some of you know that my wife had cancer. She, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, it's only been a few months. Um, and, it, and it all... With cancer, people tell you everything goes quickly, and I'm, I'm going to make this brief. Um, everything is good now. Our prognosis is wonderful. The cancer was removed. She is, as of today, cancer-free. Yeah. But from the minute we got that diagnosis, all these people in our life, they just came around as church people and others. Um, a lot of people from the basketball team that Wyatt plays on just to a secular high school, and they were giving us everything, and they were saying, oh, it's so horrible what you're going through. And we were fine. And we were only fine because, you know, our faith isn't in anything in this earth. It's not in the doctors. It's not in the amazing technology that's brought breast cancer awareness to where it is. It's not the miracle that it was, it was spotted in a routine um, exam, her annual and it was very, very early. None of that is where our faith is. It's in, it's in the Lord. And when people ask, how are you so calm? You know, I'm able to say, because we know it, nothing goes unsifted through the Lord's hands. Yes. We know that we have eternal life. Yes. And we know that this is part of God's plan. And I'll tell you, when you talk about people asking about the, um, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> they don't, but they do. Everybody that I've ever even think I've helped at all come to Christ, has seen me going through very difficult times and said, how'd you do that, yeah. Ron? How? And I'm like, unfortunately, I would like to take the credit, but I can't. It's because I can, I'm able to put everything in God's hands. And that, for me, and there's, there's a lot better ways to evangelize. I know there is. But that's my gift to be able to... Um, I think it's... Uh, uh, 
I got I have a life verse. I can't think of it now because I'm on the spot. But it's something about be ready always. Uh, huh? No. Yes. Be ready. We're gonna we'll, we'll look at that verse in a little. No, bit. no, it's not Second Peter. Okay. Anyway, leave nothing. You know, worry about nothing today. Tomorrow has enough of its own concerns. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm getting to it. Sorry. I could I could be a better Bible reader. Anyway, that's the, that's what I see Christianity does for me. All right, that's how I reach you get a whole that's, list in there. That wasn't uh, but that wasn't short. So. That's good. That's good. Thank you for sharing. All right, who else? What ha, what do you see as the benefits of being Christian? It can be just in a few words or a sentence. Yes, I'm a brand spanking new Christian, and I can't believe what a gift faith is. Yes, I mean, I I every day I think, why didn't I find this sooner? Because so many things, whether they're small or large, uh, that are heavy on your heart, I just don't right. worry because I know that it's not my deal. It's his. And what a huge gift he's given me to be a, and I'm a type A OCD. So this is amazing. And um, with us, my husband and I have a 26-year-old daughter that two years ago decided she didn't want to speak to us anymore. And mm. that was really painful. And it still is, but it's completely different now because I know it's God's plan. I can't believe that it's in his best interests for us, the three of us, to stay estranged. And so, oh my gosh, what a gift. You know what? That topic's coming up in the message here in a minute too. Very, thank you, Roxanne. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Let, let Paul go first and then you're right after. Go ahead, Paul. My name is Paul. A Christianity has brought me to a basically new care home that I loved because my other care home uh, wasn't that great. Uh -huh. And they treated me the way that they should not have treated me. But Christianity has brought me to a way of life nice. that I can know, that I can't fully explain. Thank you. All right, good. Thank you. Dwayne, you're up. And my husband, Roland, he had cancer, and pastor yep. ran his all the time. And everybody came together for us. And we were told he only had like four to six months to live. It was hard to take. But I had to be strong and show him what he was going through. It, it was real painful. It's, it's hard to describe when, a, when a, a person you love is going through all that. Yeah. But I had to be strong for him, and he was strong too. And I think I really helped. We were baptized, and I think that really helped us get through all this. All right. So, so I, I want to just sw switch it a little bit. Thank you, Lane. Let's think of specific things, not from our individual lives, but in concepts of what does salvation g provide to the child of God in general? A joy that passes understanding. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> joy. That's, that's the fruit of the Spirit, right? Vicki. Truth, knowing the truth. Wow, there is, a, there is an enlightenment that comes from knowing the Lord, isn't there? There's a lot of people that are extremely deceived right now and don't even know they're deceived. The peace of God. Yes, incredible peace. Huh? Hope, hope. all right, hope. What else? Especially today. Okay, what else comes to your mind? Just, how about, huh? Happy, yeah, it's all right. Happiness. Okay. All right. What were you going to say, Jack? Say it again. Freedom. Freedom. Okay. Okay. Yep. Right. Okay, so one, one thing you said was important, talking about forgiveness, because forgiveness is a two-way street. In the case of someone who loses a person you care deeply about, is wrestling with a forgiveness, feeling like you need a forgiveness from God. But, but here's something, being a Christian, just forgiveness. Have we stopped, have you stopped to think about just what that alone means? Forgiveness? Yes, indeed. Yep. Okay, good. Thank you. So, so 
we, can, we could go on all day about the benefits, the blessings that come from salvation in Jesus Christ. I want to share one with you that maybe you hadn't thought about. Uh, I know for me, one of the big blessings is the fruit of the Spirit because He changes us. He takes what we were and transforms it into something a lot better. <laughs> but there's another benefit, I think, that sometimes we forget about. It's the benefit of being able to share the message of salvation in Jesus Christ with someone who's never heard. I mean, the privilege of being the instrument that God uses to direct. I mean, it's wonderful when I come to faith in Christ. Yay, going to heaven. That's a big benefit. Forgiveness. Yay, that's wonderful. But think of the benefit of the privilege of being able to lead someone else to also come to saving faith in Christ. Wow. But there's one little caveat. In order to do that, we have to actually open our mouth and say the name of Jesus. I fear that sometimes as Christians, we have been so bamboozled by the enemy of our souls that we may go for days or weeks or months without ever uttering the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in public. Now, people hear the name of Jesus in public. But if they do not hear from us, how awesome it is to be a child of God. I mean, I don't know about you, but I think that one of the things that we could be telling people about Jesus is the fact that he's changed us. He has changed you, hasn't he? Wouldn't it be appropriate for us to let people know the difference he's made in our lives? And look, if you feel intimidated about opening your mouth, don't feel alone. It turns out in the book of Acts, here are the early disciples. The church has just been born. They've had the day of Pentecost. They've had the guy get healed in the steps of the temple. Some pretty awesome things have happened. Their faith is riding high at this point, but they're threatened by the religious leaders. And so they pray, Lord, look on their threats. Grant to your servants that with all boldness we may speak your word. So here they were. They had every reason to be speaking the name of the Lord Jesus. And even they prayed and said, Lord, give us boldness to speak your word. You know, I think that we would be good to pray that prayer. I think we ought to make that a daily prayer. Look, Paul, the apostle Paul, I've shown you before in Ephesians chapter 6, he said, pray for yourselves and pray for all of us and pray for me that I'll have utterance, that I'll have boldness to speak. So if Paul needed utterance, boldness to speak, and the, the apostles in the beginning prayed for boldness, Lord, grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And guess what happened? They prayed, the place was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the Word of God with boldness. Ah, you know something? God's will has not changed. His will is that none should perish. His will is that all should come to repentance. But He uses us, and He uses our humble, faltering words. It's okay. He wants to work through us, but we need to preach Christ. We need to be willing to be that instrument to actually pronounce the name of Jesus. To actually say to someone, you know, uh, I mean, there's all kinds of ways, but we need to pray and ask for him. Look for an opportunity to, to, to make a joke with someone at the paint store or at the grocery store and, and interact with them and, and get them to smile a little bit in a time when a lot of people are discouraged. And then say, you know why I smile so much? Because Jesus is the Lord of my life. Because I have been born again. I've been set free from my sin. And they may not like it. They may love it. They may haul off and swat you. It don't matter. Let's speak the name of Christ because the world needs to hear the name of Christ. How did I do that? What did I do, Rusty? I imploded the whole thing, man. Oh, there we go. Way to go. Push the button. Who knows? Okay. Am I right there at the right place? No. Got to back it up just a little bit more. Okay. There we go. Okay. All right. Four choices. First, preach Christ. Now, the next one's a real head scratcher. Release the opponents? What? That doesn't make no sense. Well, that's just, just going with what Paul did, okay? Luke wrote it down for us. When they opposed him, Paul preached. 
right? And they opposed him and blasphemed. He shook his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own head now. I'm clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Boy, do we not expect that response. Paul cared deeply about these Jewish people at the synagogue. We know because in Romans 10 and 11, he tells us. He really wanted for them to understand the truth and come to faith. And he preached to them and they rejected and opposed and wanted nothing to do with his message. Boy, that doesn't seem like, I mean, and, and so he comes to a point and says, hey, I've done everything for you, I can. Now, I do think that to be fair, we need to think about uh, how we present the gospel does make a difference. Again, you know, you know, I make the joke, you know, you know, if you're going to tell somebody about Jesus, say, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian, it's really wonderful. That's probably not going to be very meaningful to most people. Um, in other words, if what is it that motivates us to tell people about Jesus Christ? Is it not our walk with God? That's what we saw in Jude 20 and to 23. We'll look at that again at the end. Um, in other words, it's, it's the Spirit of Christ who comes into us and fills us and fills us with love, joy, peace, long-suffering, all those characteristics that are the fruit of the Spirit. And so when the fruit of the Spirit is obvious and powerful in our lives, people have to see it and take note. When we're just our old, normal, Christianized self, where, I mean, we're happy that we're on our way to heaven, but we have, still have the same furrowed brow and the same pessimistic outlook on life, um, it's probably not going to be very meaningful to most people. And so there's a need for us to be, to be filled with the Spirit and, and, and the Spirit of Christ doing a work in us, and He wants to use us to the point where people look at us and say, what is different about you? But Paul, in this case, was filled with the Spirit. He was there preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and these people still rejected and opposed, right? And so here he is, he's, he, he wants them to know the truth of salvation, and they reject and oppose. And the this, this stunning thing is, is he didn't beg them. He didn't uh, just go out of his way to try and bribe them into becoming Christians. He shared as long as he was able, as long as they were willing to listen. But you know, I, I get the distinct impression as everything I read in the New Testament, God does not come and hammer us in the head or force us to become Christians. He may present a, a complicated situation in our life, as Elaine shared with, with Roland and cancer. That gets your attention, doesn't it? But he still doesn't force people. There are many people who get cancer and die without ever turning to Christ, right? So God does not force us, and neither should we try and force people to become Christians, because it's not going to work. We're to share with them the love of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and then leave it with the Lord. Paul did. He goes, okay, I've shared with you guys. You're not interested. There's only so much I can do. There comes a point at which sometimes it actually becomes a hindrance to keep just zeroed in on one thing, one person. We need to trust the Lord to work in their lives. Trust the Lord to work through us. Now, we need to be careful that we're, trust, that we're filled with the Spirit and allowing Him to work through us. So the next choice that we have is to remain faithful. Let's seek God's will through evangelism. Four choices. Preach Christ. Release the opponents. Remain faithful. Paul, he departed from there, entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. That's funny. So he leaves it. He's not going to be at the synagogue anymore. And so he stays at the guy's house that's next door. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, wait a minute. That don't make no sense. I mean, you would have, think, you would have thought that, he, that Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, would have trusted in the Lord when Paul was there preaching to him. Nope. Nope. When Paul came to the point, he says, okay, you guys are not interested. I've done everything I can. And he removes himself, and then he starts working with the, the next person that God... Sometimes God closes a door and opens a window. So let's go for the window. Let, it's not up... It, it's not up to us to decide who it is that gets saved. It's God's work, and he works, and he plants seeds. So here's this guy, the ruler of the synagogue, who while Paul is in the synagogue telling him about Christ, nothing. But when Paul removes himself from the synagogue and starts sharing the gospel with others, then Crispus comes and trusts the Lord. And by the way, a bunch of people came with him. Isn't that interesting how God works? So when God closes the door... Look for the window, but remain faithful. He didn't feel sorry for himself. He didn't 
um, go around condemning himself. How come I didn't do a better job at the synagogue? Or, but he remained faithful and obedient, and he kept preaching the message of salvation. And when he did, all of a sudden, results began to come. God did the results because it's God's job to do the results. It's not our job to do the results. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ. Think about that. We, as God's children, are the fragrance of Christ to God, but also in this world. Now, and, and he'll point out, so we're the fragrance of, God, of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one group, we're the fragrance of death. To the other, we're the fragrance of life. So the question is, is what fragrance are we? I'm concerned that sometimes as Christians, we're not any fragrance at all. To where we go through our lives and nobody even knows that we're a Christian. That's, so how are we going to either... Uh, draw people to Christ or even make people even more determined in their unbelief if we're no fragrance at all. We, there needs to be enough of a difference in our life of, of, of Jesus Christ changing us. The fragrance of Christ needs to have enough of an impact on our lives so that people can actually smell something. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, it's, it's, um, there needs to be enough fragrance that people can tell there's something different about us. And I fear that in far too many cases, far too many Christians, we don't have any fragrance at all. Or worse yet, we have more of the fragrance of the world than we do of Christ. How are we going to be attracting anyone to Christ if we are more like the world than we are like a genuine child of God? And so therefore, we will never have the privilege of, or opportunity of guiding someone to saving faith in Christ because there's not enough of the aroma of Christ in our lives to make a difference. He says, who's sufficient for these things? Indeed, it's not like we get the, the fragrance of Christ out of a bottle. It's not as if we can buy it at Walmart. The fragrance of Christ is something that has to do with the Holy Spirit filling us. But Paul remained faithful. He's, he's opposed. He's resisted, rejected, refused by those whom he thought should be open to the gospel. And he didn't just quit and give up. No, he remained faithful and began looking for those whom God would reach through his testimony. It's not up to us to decide who's going to be saved and who won't. And so we have this privilege of remaining faithful. And finally, expect direction. Expect direction. So we read of Paul, the Lord spoke to him in, an, in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak. Do not keep silent. Why do you suppose the Lord told him that? He was already being threatened. He might have even been getting death threats. The Lord says, don't be afraid. I know you've already been stoned almost to death once. <laughs> don't be afraid. Speak. Do not keep silent. Mm. For I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. Wow. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. And so Paul is, is, is given specific direction. Paul kind of had specific direction all along. Do you remember clear back when he was going to Damascus and the Lord struck him down at noon and, and, and uh, Ananias was sent to go minister to, to, to Saul at that time? Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. The Lord said to him, go for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul was selected out by God before he was even baptized. The Lord already knew how he was going to use him in ministry. You know something? I believe every one of us have a role in ministry that we alone were designed to play. I mean, you look around at our church, you're going to see all kinds of temperaments, different personalities. God's not surprised by that. He loves that diversity in us. And he uses the diversity. There are people that Roxanne could reach with the gospel that, that Charlie couldn't, and vice versa. That's okay. God uses different kinds of people to reach different kinds of people. And what a privilege we have to be the person God made us to be. 
And, and God will use us to share the love of Christ if we're willing to submit to the Holy Spirit and be the tool he wants us to be, that we can speak to someone for Jesus Christ and have the privilege of guiding someone to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Not only from the time he was born again was the Lord already spelling out how he would be used, but in Acts chapter 13, the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Serene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. He was kind of the bottom guy in the totem pole at this point in his ministry, and yet the Lord said, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so God guided them. Do you know that all through Paul's life, from, from this point on, he was ready to do what God asked him to do in evangelism, and therefore God guided his steps over and over. God said, no, don't go there. Yes, go here. And many times it wasn't the other people who were working with him. It was Paul who received the specific direction, where to go, who to speak to. So what if, what if we know what God wants us to do? We know that he desires for us to tell people about Jesus Christ, but we say, no, I'm not going to do that, God, but I still want you to tell me what I should do with the rest of my life. Do we really think that's what's going to happen? No, no. We, we can expect direction from God when we're obedient to what he's already told us. And what he's already told us is, is that we have the privilege of telling people about Jesus Christ. I think Satan wants us to think of it like a lot of children think about a chore. It's kind of funny. I, I remember when I was a kid and um, living in Watsonville, and I remember standing in front of the sink and my mother saying, look, you two boys, you're going to wash the dishes. I don't care if you stand there until 9 o'clock tonight. If you want to stand there and waste three hours by arguing and by fooling around, wasting your time, that's fine, but you're still going to do the dishes. <laughs> Like, why would I make it such a monstrous thing that I didn't want to just do them? And I think that there's a lot of people today who, for whatever reason, maybe when they were kids they weren't required to do chores, but they look at certain things as a chore. Oh, i got to take out the garbage. And it's like, oh, I keep putting it off and procrastinating. Students have this. Oh, I just don't want to do that assignment. They put it off and they put it off and put it off until they get half credit because they didn't want to do it on time. Why not just do it? Well, I think that sometimes as Christians, we have allowed ourselves to be duped by Satan to, to, to have that kind of an attitude towards the gospel. We act like it's a chore. It's not a chore. It's a privilege. It's a privilege, but it's only a privilege depending on our walk with the Lord, isn't it? Oh, yeah. That is what makes the difference. It's a privilege because of our walk with the Lord. The Lord spoke to Paul in the night, said, don't be afraid, speak. Paul received this direction from the Lord because he was already being faithful and doing what God asked him to do. I don't, I don't think Paul would have gotten this kind of direction if he had just said, no, I'm, 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 not, I'm not doing it, I'm going to wait, or let somebody else do it. He was faithful doing what he already knew God wanted him to do, and therefore he received direction from the Lord. And I believe we can expect direction from the Lord when we're willing to be obedient and do what he's asked us to do. But really it comes down to, in large part, our relationship with the Lord. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, and here's the key verb that the other three participles surround, keep yourselves in the love of God. If, 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 my, if my walk with God and my love for the Lord has gone tepid, it's gone flat, if it's lost life, then... I'm just not going to be telling people about the Lord. If all I'm concerned about is my life and my future and what I'm doing, what I want, then I'm not going to be telling people about the Lord. If, if, if the things of this life, the things that I just bought, the, the new toy that I have, the new this or the new that, if that's what's the most important thing in my life, I will not be telling people about Jesus Christ. I'll be telling them about my new toy. That's more important. Our, our love for the Lord is what orients and what makes possible our testimony for Jesus Christ. So when our walk with God is alive and vibrant and a, and a cancer diagnosis comes into our life, suddenly we have the structure and basis with which how to deal with it. When a cancer diagnosis comes into our life and we don't know the Lord is our Savior, wow, it's frightening, isn't it? 
But when we know Christ as our Lord and Savior, it changes things. But not only know Him, but when our walk with Him is alive. So I... In fact, it's kind of interesting because really our testimony for Christ is so directly related to our walk with God that I think we can actually thank God if we go and share the gospel with someone and it just goes flat. I think we ought to thank God because that's sort of like a barometer that tells you, you need to go home and, and get down on your knees and, and check out your walk with God. How's your walk with God doing? I, I really think we need to stop and take inventory. These disciples and Paul, when they went on the missionary trips and the guys in the early chapters of the book of, of Acts, they were on fire. They'd been set free. They'd been forgiven. They were on their way to heaven. They knew that they, were the, they had fellowship with the believers. They had all kinds of things that made them thrilled. They couldn't wait to tell people about Jesus Christ. So what is it that makes you excited about being a Christian? I think we ought to take... Can I challenge you? Go home this week and say, what is, it that makes me, what is it that makes me excited about being a Christian? Anything? Maybe write it down, think about it, and thank God for it. Lord, I thank you for salvation. Thank you. Just forgiveness of sins. Just forgiveness. Just think of that. My sins are forgiven. Just, just fellowship with God Almighty, that Almighty God cares about fellowship with me. Just, just the fruit of the Spirit. There's no other way to have the fruit of the Spirit except through Jesus Christ. The, the privilege of love, joy, peace, long-suffering when everyone else is moping around all feeling sorry for themselves. Are you kidding me? <laughs> we have so many reasons to be thankful, but one of them is the privilege of telling people about Jesus Christ. I just I don't want us to think of this as some horrible chore that somehow has hung around our neck like a noose. It's a chore if we're not in a close fellowship with our Lord. So let's pray that God will, will, will stir us up. Let's pray for revival in our church. Let's pray that God... Do you know what my desire is for every person that's here today? Not only that you'll know Christ as your Savior, but that every person here will have the privilege of leading someone to Jesus Christ as their Savior this year. That's my heart's desire. There's no greater privilege or joy than that. I can't make that happen. I can't even make that happen for me, but I know how to pray, and I know how to ask God, and I know how to seek Him. Let's pray and, and, and ask God to use us. Peter says, sanctify. Set apart the Lord God in your hearts. That's just like uh, keep yourselves in the love of Christ. It's just like the same thing that, that, that Jude just wrote. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. In other words... That what matters most to you is that relationship and fellowship with, the, with, with our Almighty God. Sanctify, set apart the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Wow. See, when we have set apart the Lord in our hearts, and that's what matters to us, then we'll be ready to give a, a defense, an answer. So, um, yeah. Yeah. My great desire, my great prayer for all of us is that we will have hearts that are set on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we have a lot of comfort in America. I don't want to blame the comfort. I like sitting in a soft chair. I've sat on benches, hard benches. I've sat on benches that I made in Brazil for many years. I have a deep appreciation for comfortable chairs. Um, there's nothing wrong with comfortable chairs. But let's not get our hearts set on these things. Let's get our hearts set on what matters, which is real, genuine fellowship with Jesus Christ. So would you do something? Let, let's stand. Let's stand. And let's find a way to join hands, a big circle all the way around the outside. We're going to pray together. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you today. Thank you for this church. Thank you for every person that's here, every person that's a part of it. Dear Lord, Right here in this group, there are people who have deep, deep longings for members of their family that do not know Christ. Heavenly Father, our prayer today is that you would do something special in every one of us. Lord, we're not only asking that you would save those people that we love and care about, we're asking, Father, that you would do something special in our hearts, that the love of Christ would become so real, that your Holy Spirit would so fill and empower us, that we could not keep silent about the Lord Jesus Christ, not trying to hammer people into salvation, 
just telling them about how awesome it is to know Jesus Christ. Dear Lord, our desire, our prayer for this week is that you would use every one of us somewhere in public with someone, that we would speak with boldness the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and tell someone about how awesome it is to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Heavenly Father, we're asking you to do this in our lives in a powerful way to use us as a church. How in the world could the, could the gospel of Jesus Christ go forward in a really messed up world if we who know Jesus Christ do not speak your name in the power of your spirit? So Lord, our prayer this week is that every one of us would have the privilege of telling someone about the Lord Jesus Christ in the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name I come to you to share his love as he told.